Great. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, press conference uh, about the upcoming COP, United Nations Biodiversity Conference, COP 16, to take place in Cali, Colombia, from the 21st of October to the 1st of November. My name is David Ainsworth. I'm the head of the communications unit at the Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. Our press conference today, we're delighted to have the presence of Her Excellency Susanna Muhammad, the Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development of Colombia, and Astrid Schomacher, who is the Executive Secretary of the Convention on Biological Diversity. We'll have some brief remarks from each of the panelists, uh, and then we'll open the floor for questions. We'll take questions here in the room, and then also some questions from online. Uh, Minister Mohammed, the floor is yours. Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much uh, for this uh, space. Uh, we are one month before COP16 in Cali, Colombia. Uh, we are glad to communicate that uh, there is a lot of interest. There is record of asking for accreditations by international delegations. We have more than 100 ministers confirmed. 12 heads of state are coming uh, to Biodiversity COP. And uh, uh, this means also that we are increasing uh, substantially the, politically, the political profile of the Biodiversity COP and uh, start fulfilling one of the main objectives the Colombian government has as a, co as a host of the Biodiversity COP, which is actually to increase the profile uh, of biodiversity within the climate crisis. We also are about to complete 100 pre-COP events of preparation, opening the participation uh, of different sectors of society as COP16 also wants to materialize that principle of the coming Montreal uh, Agreement framework, which is the mobilization of whole of government and whole of society. We will have ministers of work, we will have ministers of agriculture, we will have ministers of finance, but also we will have the very strong presence of indigenous peoples, Afro-descendant communities, peasants, the business sector, which is also has asked uh, uh, all of them uh, a record height of accreditations. Uh, the green zone uh, will be the largest green zone that has been done on a biodiversity COP, uh, including uh, the uh, mobilization of 900 events during the two weeks that had been programmed by uh, different sectors themselves, 42% of those events by social movements and 17% by the private sector and other 17% by uh, agencies, international agencies, with the participation of more than 30 countries. And uh, finally, uh, we are working uh, very hard so that Cali is prepared to receive the world. We have uh, created these uh, in very important ways of incidence between the green zone and blue zone so that the voices uh, of all sectors are heard as we want or we have uh, put as a second objective that it is, this is people's COP. And today we have a launch here at the UN, the Peace for Nature Coalition. We are almost at the end of the draft declaration, which will be a multi-stakeholder coalition. Uh, where that will, the declaration will be open for signature by all stakeholders, including governments, and it will be uh, the, the platform that the Colombian presidency wants uh, after COP16 to mobilize uh, in, in terms of creating awareness, communication, capacity, and mobilization for protecting nature. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minister. I invite the Executive Secretary, Astrid Schomacher, to make a few remarks. Thank you, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. It's a pleasure to be here with Minister Mohammed. As she said, we're just one week, uh, one month, sorry, <laughs> getting ahead of myself, one month uh, away from the COP. It will be a COP with record high participation. We're expecting around 14,000 delegates at this point. And as the minister had said, the COP has several functions. It will open the space for very, very important political discussions, in particular around the theme of peace with nature, but also around synergies between climate change and biodiversity loss. And this is the theme that we see resonate throughout this climate week here at the UN. Everybody's talking about how can we bring these agendas together. COP16 is the first COP after the landmark declaration at COP28, where the presidencies came together and said we need to look differently 
at these uh, synergies and how we can materialize them in practice. But peace with nature is such a great theme for our COP, we believe, because peace with nature is really about having a different way of interacting with nature, understanding ourselves in a different way as parts of nature. But all of that is a declaration. The question is then always, how do we implement And As we see it, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, which we'd like to see as our Paris Agreement for Nature, which was adopted just under two years ago in Montreal at COP15, basically gives us the roadmap for living in peace with nature because it's about protecting and restoring nature. It's about prospering with nature, sharing its benefits fairly and collaborating with nature. And that again is at the meta level, but we have 23 very clear action-oriented targets. And this COP now is our first opportunity to take stock of where we are in implementation. It's an implementation COP. Countries were asked to do a national biodiversity strategy and action plans and to formulate targets and uh, by COP16. Not everybody is there yet, but we're having more and more countries come forward uh, with their targets so that we can do a first analysis and see, are we on, on the right track? So we already have now 72 parties that have submitted national targets and much more are to come. In addition to that, we also have other important items on the agenda, in particular the operationalization, and now it becomes a complicated term, of the multilateral mechanism for the sharing of benefits from the use of digital sequencing information on genetic resources. That is a very complex term and issue, but it is about ultimately about how those Industries, sectors, companies that use digital sequence information on genetic resources that is often located in the global south, but not exclusively, how they use it and how they pay for using it ultimately. So already at COP15, we agreed to establish a mechanism, multilateral mechanism for that. We agreed to set up a fund. Now it's about operationalizing this fund. And of course, and I think uh, the minister has also already referred to that, there will be more discussions about mobilizing resources. That is very, very important. Money is short, so that will continue. And there will be very, very important discussions on how we can elevate the voice of indigenous people and local communities and the important role that traditional knowledge can play in um, achieving our objectives on biodiversity uh, conservation. So we look forward to an exciting COP and really to a massive mobilization, certainly of Colombian society, but as we can already see in the numbers that come to our COP, huge interest in the discussions there. And I think we will have a very important political moment and a very important moment for biodiversity moving forward. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you to our panelists. So for the question period, we're going to go back and forth between people here in the room, and I'm also receiving some questions uh, online. So uh, first of all, I'll take a question from here in the room. So please uh, raise your hand and introduce yourself. This gentleman right in the front, please. Uh, hi, this is Sam Ahmed with AFP. Um, I don't want to ask. So Minister uh, Mohammed, what will um, a successful COP look like? Uh, what's your best case scenario in terms of um, uh, uh, making uh, operationalizing uh, countries' targets and, and uh, DSI and, and, and finances and so on. If you could talk about your best case scenario. Uh, okay, yes. In terms of the negotiation, uh, we would like uh, the DSI uh, fund to be approved so that it's ready for implementation because this is an implementation COP. So we would like the decision of the parties to give the COP the teeth for implementation. So one is the DSI. Second, it will be approving the program of work for Article 8J on indigenous peoples and local communities, including the uh, approval of a subsidiary permanent body, body, which will create a platform for indigenous peoples and local communities to access directly resources, and also to have a program that is multilaterally agreed and supported. And that will be also a very important step forward. Uh, third, uh, we want to take stock of what's the situation on targets and what's the situation on biodiversity plans, but also understanding what are the obstacles of implementation and being very sensitive and very clear on those obstacles so we can address them. Uh, that will be the third issue. And fourth, on finance, uh, there is a, the Colombian government will open a broader discussion, which we will not close at COP16, around all the uh, situation of finance, which is not only about the fund of biodiversity that has been already created, but actually how to access finance. But in terms of the negotiation, um, as we create momentum, hopefully we can reach uh, a landing zone 
where uh, we could have an intergovernmental process started to create a new mechanism that is broad in terms of how to use different uh, mobilization of sources. But at the same time, uh, I would like to call uh, for the developed world to actually increase the pledge towards the biodiversity fund as we need to give a signal that the commitments that were agreed on the Commitment Montreal Framework are going on track, uh, although we're not going to take stock on that in 2024, but 2025, it's very important to understand that there is uh, a commitment that is going to be fulfilled because this is fundamental for the trust uh, between the parties. Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, I'd just like to note that the answer received from the Minister addresses a question received online from Reuters looking at some of the most important points to be discussed at COP16. So, Oliver, that question of yours has been addressed by the Minister. But there's another one that I think the Minister could answer is uh, Bloomberg would like to, to know who are some of the heads of state that we have confirmed for the meeting already? Thank you. There are heads of state uh, from the region and outside the region. Some of the heads of states confirmed include uh, President Lula from Brazil, uh, the new president, Claudia Schaumburg uh, from Mexico, uh, the president of Honduras, also the president from Guinea-Bissau, uh, uh, the president uh, from... Uh, sorry, I got blank. I'll, I'll have the list uh, here. Let me open it. Um, We have the vice president uh, from Kenya, uh, and uh, we are looking forward for further confirmation so we can send uh, all the list of, of presidents uh, that have been uh, confirming. Uh, some from Africa, some from Latin America. Thank you. Just an editorial comment. Uh, and also, uh, we also have confirmed the uh, secretary general of the UN uh, that will be also in the Biodiversity COP. This list of the number of heads of state is the highest number we've ever had for a biodiversity cop, so it's notable. We have a question here from the front. Can you please introduce yourself, too? Yeah, this is Jennifer Mendes from IFP. Would you like to know how you are going to address the problem of security, as some of the guerrillas groups have uh, threatened uh, the, uh, the conference itself? Yes, yeah, you know, uh, we still have uh, some arm, arm struggle in Colombia and some of the regions. Uh, we have had a, a very strong security plan that has been worked out between the Defense Ministry of the Colombian government with uh, the United Nations, the CDB. Uh, the Colombian government has already signed the annex of the contract on security, and it has been a very very strong joint effort between the local uh, police, we will be uh, the local government, the national government, and the CDB will be mobilizing more than 10,000 uh, forces towards Cali, and also a very strong uh, security plan that has already started uh, implementation. But beyond that, uh, there's been also uh, continuously uh, you know, talks through the peace uh, tables uh, that still remain. Uh, part of those dissidents uh, have publicly uh, made a statement uh, supporting COP, and part of the threat has also been back up, back, back, has been um, backed down by the by the other uh, militants. So we, of course, are um, constantly on the security plan, and it will be permanently in implementation. We will have three. Uh, main joint um, rooms of following up COP16, one from Bogota, one from Cali, and one uh, from uh, the Ministry of Defense uh, that will be on a line uh, in, in real uh, time following all the events. And we have secured all the areas where COP16 uh, will be happening. So it's a very strong security effort, and we are confident that COP16 has the security conditions for its development. Great, thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to the next question online, and that comes from Tetsuji Ida of Kyodo News. Uh, he's actually got two parts to the question, and I'll let both of our panelists offer it. So the first one is he wants to know a bit about um, the timelines, roadmaps, or targets of this, this notion that there might be a new global biodiversity fund. Can I have the panelists comment? This is one issue under negotiation, so uh, comments on what the, what the les enjeux, if we'd say in French, are for that. Thanks. Yes, that is a um, draft decision that has been uh, put forward by the working group on DSI 
has it's been a very extensive uh, work. Right now, that draft decision in some of the critical points have specifically some options for negotiation to continue during COP16. And uh, uh, the, what we want is to have all the key elements of being able to put the DSI benefit sharing mechanism in place so that it can has the, the minimum elements for implementation. Even if that implementation will start during the next two years, if the parties approve that, and then can be refined at next COP, which is also an innovative way to address these issues. And not everything has to be exactly ready, but you have the main elements agreed by the parties. You can start a uh, first phase of implementation. You can then evaluate, and in, 20, in COP17, uh, continue refining the mechanism. And that's what we aim in for. Uh, we were very happy that a very long discussion, more than 10 years of discussion, has already selected very critical possibilities for the parties to decide, and we uh, hope to be able to facilitate the process so that these decisions are made. Thank you. Um, the second part of Tetsuji's question is said there will be a huge presence of Japanese industries and financial institutions from Japan. Is there a message for them how they can contribute to realize the achievement of the new Global Biodiversity Framework Fund, or Biodiversity Framework, pardon me? Yes, we are glad also by the enthusiasm of the participation of the private sector. And the Colombian government has made a, a good work on uh, inviting all types of private sector from the popular economy towards the largest uh, companies. And uh, we have a very active agenda uh, on the business forum in the green zone, but also then in the blue zone, where actually we want to work with the private sector on the 23 targets of the Colmi Montreal Agreement, especially target 15, so that they understand, because what we understand now is that their main question is how can we from the private uh, sector implement the Colmi Montreal Agreement? There's a lot of curiosity and a lot of questions, but we have also invited uh, innovative entrepreneurs and new companies, new business, new thinking in business, that is already addressing the, na the nature crisis within the business models. Uh, and is, uh, we want that cross-fertilization of ideas and those new platforms uh, for uh, moving forward. Also having the discussion on what it means and how can uh, be that transition when uh, the countries start phasing out some of the subsidies that are harmful uh, to nature and what are the alternatives. So it's going to be a very lively discussion and we expect uh, from all the private sector, including the Japanese companies, to be able to network, to be able to create platforms, but also to get consciousness and understanding how the Kulmi Montreal uh, framework can be implemented from the business sector, but also what's the role as the principle of the Kulmi Montreal framework is the mobilization of the whole government and whole of society. Uh, we have uh, Astrid, would you like to respond before we move to other questions? I think there was a very comprehensive um, response already, but maybe just to say I've been in Japan several weeks ago, and Japan, of course, was the host of COP10. COP10 adopted at the time the Aichi targets and also put in place the Nagoya Protocol. And it was one of these moments where I think the fact didn't just come, the COP didn't just come there and go, but the COP left behind a legacy in terms of a new understanding of interacting with nature. And therefore we see very much Japanese companies at the forefront of this debate in the business sector about how one can be nature positive. It is Japanese companies, if I'm correctly informed, that are, I think, the ones that have responded most positively and with greatest alacrity to the TNFD, so the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, and have started implementing those uh, metrics. It is Jap Japanese companies that support, and the Japanese government, very much youth mobilization. And it is Japanese companies that have a particular interest in DSI. And as the minister has said, Jap we expect all of these companies to engage constructively. J Japanese companies can bring a lot to the table in terms of innovation and a lot of the discussion about making biodiversity or resolving our biodiversity crisis is about innovation, certainly innovation in behavior and behavioral change, but also techno technological innovation and their Japanese companies are often at the forefront. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Now we have many questions here. There's a, a woman there in the fourth row. You might need to use your microphone so we can hear you. Thanks. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome. Uh, my question is for the Minister Mohammed. Um, what, what outlet are you from? Uh, my name is Elizabeth with Prensa Latina. Bienvenida. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Minister, my question is, um, do you think that this seven uh, at this level is, uh, it can make any difference uh, for the peace process? And um, if there is any kind of discussion about specifically Latin America uh, challenge for the climate crisis? Thank you. Yes, I, I think this event can make a difference uh, for the peace uh, process in two ways. First, uh, in terms of empowering and mobilizing local communities of the regions where actually still the conflict and the armed struggle is happening, especially confronting illicit economies, which is one of the key aspects uh, that are threatening communities and biodiversity and where actually the key regions in Colombia where biodiversity hotspots are, as are specifically the ones where we are having this struggle. So the empowering of those communities, the access of knowledge, the access of networks, so that we can consolidate alternatives uh, is critical for co the Colombian uh, stabilization of those regions. The second part uh, would be more through the Peace uh, High Commissioner for Peace in Colombia, who also will be at COP16, and we will be working with our partners uh, that have supported the peace process in Colombia to go uh, uh, to use this international opportunity also to send message to the uh, armed actors. And that message is, of course, up front, but it's also through the conversations uh, and the, connect, the connections that are, are happening. It's a critical moment in Colombia. It's also a critical moment for the armed actors to decide uh, if and get or not convinced if illicit economies is to be continues uh, to be the path that will, uh, you know, be a, a is becoming a very difficult issue for Colombia, or if they are able to foresee, as the world will be in Colombia, the possibilities of consolidating peace and leaving those um, illicit economies. Uh, Colombia also is pursuing um, initial memorandum of understanding or declaration on the issue of illicit economies and biodiversity, since it's one of the sensitive issues that also affects uh, human rights. So for sure, in conclusion, we foresee that having COP16, especially in Cali, uh, could have ramifications and an impact on the peace talks in, within the country. Thank you very much, Minister. I'll take another question from the floor here, the second row, the gentleman here. Uh, Minister Javier Otazo from FN News Agency. I'd like to have your view on the, the goals of the rich countries, the, the polluting countries, and the global south, as we say uh, lately. So are they sharing the same goals for the summit, or do you still see differences, important differences? Well, we all the parties have in common that uh, we have collectively approved the Conmin Montreal framework. And that I think that's a very important a point of cohesion and point of um, success uh, of multilateralism to protect biodiversity. The challenge in Cali is to go into the house and the implementation. We see that there's still a difference on the financial issue. That will be one of the issues that will have a uh, discussion. We could have some difference of, of the DSI uh, but what we need is to work with the parties so that we can go through those differences and get the best collective result. Uh, that's the aim of the negotiation. Uh, but of course, not everything is decided. We have uh, uh, a lot of the decisions full of brackets still. And uh, we will have, uh, as a presidency, to see all the landscape of the process. Uh, to help the parties to agree. But uh, I think one of the most uh, difficult issues will be the financing discussion, which also is permeating not only the biodiversity COP, but the climate COP that is coming. And that's why it's so important that uh, we can open avenues of understanding, because I think COP16, if goes well, could, be, could actually help the international community also towards the discussions that are going to come towards uh, COP29. Astrid, would you want to comment as well on these? Uh, yeah, okay. Right. Sergio Colombo has got a question online. He's the biodiversity correspondent from Carbon Pulse, and Sergio is asking uh, both uh, the executive secretary and the minister to respond. What role could biodiversity credits play in bridging the finance gap on biodiversity? Uh, are there any actions that can be taken at COP16 to help create a robust and high integrity market? I think it will take both of you to answer this question. 
Eh, ok, there is eh, a sort, uh, uh, a set of financial mechanisms that are under discussion. So far, we focus mainly on one that has been international development cooperation, which already, at least in the biodiversity uh, convention is already materialized through the fund that has been created and that is now being asked by the developed world to put the money in. But there is a whole work of parties around issues such as international taxation, such as uh, debt for climate and nature, uh, swaps as a multilateral agreement, such as the issues of risk uh, assessment, also the fund that uh, Brazil is proposing around uh, forest, which actually is a good intersection between biodiversity and climate. And, and here the critical issue is, and there is a decision on, in, in the coming Montreal framework, which I think is very powerful, that we have to take out subsidies that harm biodiversity. Uh, so there is a suite of mechanisms for public finance. Now, we, I think as, as parties are examining, still we haven't got into an agreement of Article 6 in the climate uh, discussion around the carbon markets, which in many countries uh, have not yet been able to fulfill their promise and on the opposite has created contradictions which one of the main stakeholders of the biodiversity uh, convention which is the indigenous peoples. Uh, and there is parties of course working also in that other alternative which will be biodiversity certificates, biodiversity bonds, debt bonds. There's a, so we will have to examine that um, as an ecosystem, uh, we don't believe that there is one single bullet solution that will solve the financial issue. And that's basically the discussion that uh, we will have. The key message will be that uh, the market approaches will need to uh, be able to comply uh, with what the Coming Montreal uh, uh, framework already states, that is the respect for human rights and also uh, of in the, the, the safeguards for indigenous peoples. I think it's only an initial conversation. For sure it will be a conversation happening uh, within different stakeholders at COP16, but it's uh, something that is only starting. And I think the financial discussion is much more richer than only one instrument and uh, we have put in the finance day actually the possibility to start discussing all these uh, alternatives to create a consistent process of finance uh, as is required by the framework. Yeah, there's not much to compliment. That was a very comprehensive answer. But, uh, but just to say that at COP15, we have already said that uh, nature credits are to be examined as part of the need to mobilize uh, financial resources from all sources in recognition of uh, public funding never being enough. The funding up for biodiversity has been quantified by UNIP at $700 billion um, dollars per year. So ODA will never bring us even close to that. So we, we need to look at finding new money in new places. And certainly the biodiversity credit debate is one that has a role to play there. And uh, I think what we've seen since uh, COP15 was a lot of thinking in this space, very interesting analyses produced, for example, by the UNEP Finance Initiative, various consultancies have looked at it. There is, of course, a lot happening in the space of carbon credits that offers valuable lessons. And at COP15, we will also, 16, sorry, <laughs> we will also have the space uh, for companies and for those that drive this debate forward. So, for example, the Nature Positive Alliance, which um, has a lot of support in the NGO community and in the private sector to look at how those biodiversity credits could be developed and shaped in a way that the right guardrails are, are put in place. And I think the minister mentioned some of those that, that are important in, in that area. And maybe then also to mention there is something called the Nature Positive Summit that is hosted by Australia. Australia is a country that works with biodiversity credits and wants to share the experience. That takes place just a week before the COP in Colombia and brings together a number of ministers from the Asia Pacific region, but also from other parts of the world and business sector. And they want to look more specifically at how we can bring that debate forward and how we can learn from the carbon credit market, uh, discuss if there's, is there even a market for biodiversity credits at all, but most importantly, how can they be done in such a way that they're actually nature positive, so positive for biodiversity and avoid, um, for example, 
um, negative impacts on indigenous communities or others. Great, thank you very much. With apologies to everyone here and online, we have to end the conference. Both of our panelists have got other appointments that actually started five minutes ago. So uh, thank you for your time. We'll uh, see you all in Cali, whether in person or online. Have a very good day. <laughs>